Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor in yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic out there. So today on the podcast, guys, we're going to be talking about how air traffic control and pilots choose which runway they're going to be used at an airport. So make sure, make sure you stay tuned. I think you're going to like this one. Right guys, so in order for you to understand this subject, you need to first understand how an airport generally is constructed. So when they build an airport, they tend to want to do that in an area where there are little um, obstacles around, where there's not too much people because of noise, and they try to choose a runway direction which is going to be parallel to the most common prevailing wind in that area. And that is to try to avoid getting too much crosswind and try to get as much headwind as possible. So you might have noticed that the different runways around always have numbers in the beginning of them. Now, um, the way that the numbers are being put on the runways is you have to understand a little bit about navigation to start off with. So if you have, you know, in school where you looked at the compass rows where you would have uh, north, you would have east, south and west. Well, the compass rose is divided into 360 degrees, okay? Where north is either zero or 360, east is 090 degrees, south is 180 degrees, and west is 270 degrees. So when they construct a runway, they will determine what magnetic heading the runway center line has, right? So in the case, for example, of Girona, the magnetic heading is 195 degrees. Okay, so it's almost suddenly. 195 degrees is then rounded, normally they round to the closest 10. In the case of 195, it's rounded to the higher, so 200 degrees. And then you take off the last zero, so that becomes runway 20. Subsequently, since the runway is straight, if you go 180 around and you come from the other direction the runway magnetic heading from that direction is going to be 015 rounded up to 020 taken off the last zero and you have runway 02 so in Girona subsequently you have runway 20 from one direction and runway 02 from the other if you have several runways they are going to be numbered if they're parallel to each other they're going to be numbered right center or left for example. Now, if you want a really thorough and good explanation about um, how runway numbers are constructed, I recommend you to check out Men um, Mentor. I recommend you to check out Captain Joe's excellent video on the subject. Uh, he's done a really, really dive and you know deep explanation on this, so check that out. Now, when it comes to which runway that we choose, um, it's going to be a conversation between air traffic control and the pilots, but generally speaking, the air traffic control will assign a runway in use. And that runway tends to be the runway that has the highest headwind component, okay? Now, the wind is given from the direction the wind is blowing, okay? So the runway is given which runway the runway is heading, and the wind is where it's coming from. So if we have a wind of say 170 degrees at 20 knots, it means the wind is now coming from the south, almost from the south, at 20 knots. So we would then choose a runway that is heading towards that wind. And in the case of Girona, that will be runway 20 because that's closest to that wind direction, right? Why do we want, more, why do we want headwind then? Well, if you think about it, and you need to understand a little bit about aerodynamics when it comes to this, right? A, an air, aircraft is always trying, is always measuring its speed in relation to the surrounding air. So while your car, for example, is measuring its speed in relation to the ground, it's because the tires are in connection to the ground and it's very easy to calculate your speed based on that. But a, an aircraft, wants to know how much wind is blowing over the wings to know if it's close to stall speed or over speed or the, the most efficient speed for the wings, okay? So the airspeed is what's important. And if you think about it, if you are standing on runway 20 and you have a wind blowing from 200 degrees at 20 knots, it means that 
as you're standing still on the runway threshold, getting ready for takeoff, you already have an airspeed of 20 knots for free without adding any thrust. So this means that as you're adding thrust and you start rolling down the runway, you are going to meet your rotation speed quicker. So you're gonna need a shorter takeoff distance if you have headwind compared to tailwind because the rotation speed is based on indicated airspeed and that's the speed Say let's, say let's say it's 140 knots, it's the speed when the aircraft can safely start to fly. The same is true for landing. So if we're coming in and our touchdown speed is 140 knots, for example, we have 20 knots of headwind, it means that our ground speed, our speed in relation to the ground, is not 140 knots, it's actually 120 knots with that headwind. So when we come down on the runway and we start braking, well then we only need to break the aircraft down from 120 knots to zero, rather than what we would have had in zero wind, which is 140 to zero. So we need less landing distance. And this is the reason why pilots always want headwind. Okay, it is safer and it's more efficient that way. So, which runway is going to be in use is going to be decided based on headwind or the prevailing wind largely. But there might also be a there might also be a discussion if you have a runway. For example, Girona is a good example where the uh, most of the arrivals are coming from the north. There's a lot of mountains around, so in order to get into runway 02, you need to do a quite lengthy arrival procedure that will take more time, burn more fuel, and subsequently be bought um, more expensive for the airline and worse for the environment. Well, in that case, it is likely that air traffic control is going to want to use runway 20 more often because it's a shorter arrival route, makes everyone happy. Now, we as pilots can accept to do tailwind landings and tailwind takeoffs, but only to a certain extent. Okay? First of all, obviously, we need to do very, very thorough um, calculations, landing distance calculations, takeoff calculations, to see if we can actually do it performance-wise. Some airlines have different limitations. Okay? My airline, for example, we can accept an absolute maximum takeoff tailwind of 10 knots, so even if we would performance-wise be able to take off with more tailwind, we don't do it. It has handling implications, okay? There's easier to do tail strikes if you have tailwind than headwind. And for landing, we can accept up to a maximum of 15 knots tailwind on approved runways. Most runways are limited to 10 knots, both for takeoff and landing. All right, so, but providing that the wind is inside of these limits, that our performance calculations shows that we can actually accept it performance-wise, well, in that case, we can do tailwind landing. So we can go into, or take off, so we can go into airport and accept that, okay? But in the large majority of cases, it's always going to be the runway that has the most headwind that is going to be the runway in use for the, um, the reasons that I've stated already. Now, how do we know what, when, what runway is in use then, or what the weather is like? Well. Most airports have something called an ATIS. It's a, an automatic transmission of which runway and approach type is in use, the prevailing weather conditions at the airport, and if there's something special. So maybe there's work in progress or some navigates are not working or something. This is an automatic message that is being sent out via VHF radio to, you know, as far as it can reach basically. So before we start our approach, we tend to have tuned in the, um, that radio frequency, it's a specific frequency for each airport. Listen to the 80s, which is coming in code format, and I'm going to be doing a specific podcast about how to decode that code later on. Uh, but that will tell us which runways you use so that we can base you know, our approach briefing on something. Because we want to try to have the approach briefing done and everything prepared, including the performance figure, before we start a descent. So that during the descent, we only need to do a quick recalculation of the performance figures if the wind would turn out to be different, for example. But this is how we get to know it. You might have uh, ACARS in your airline as well. In that case, you can get the, um, the weather information and the runway news through the ACARS in written form. But I would say that in you know 90% of the cases, especially during uh, long and short haul, um, sorry, short and medium haul operations in Europe, we are using ATIS still. 
Guys, I, I really hope you like this one. I hope it makes sense to you. As always, send in your questions. Make sure that you've subscribed to the channel. And if you really want to help the channel out and you want to support the work that I'm doing, then go and check out my Patreon page, which I'm going to link to here. Uh, the patrons are helping me out. They're previewing my videos. They're telling me if there's something they think I should do more of or less of before the videos actually go out to all of you guys. So they're doing a great job with that. Um, I am also scheduling Skype uh, hangouts and stuff with selected patrons just to if they have any questions if you have any specific questions that you want to talk to me about that's the best way of doing it. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are guys and I'll see you next time.